Um, at its base, delta S is Q reversible over T. So, but how to apply this and extrapolate this to a couple of other situations? So, let's talk about those couple of other situations. Let's talk about a, like, reversible isothermal compression or expansion of a gas. So, let's go back a little bit. What is reversible isothermal? So, first of all, isothermal expansion or compression of a perfect gas. What does that tell you? Temperature is constant. And if the temperature of a gas is constant, then what else is constant? Internal energy. And so in this case, this is going to tell me that, yep, delta U is equal to zero. Well, what is delta U also equal to by definition? And so in this case, my goal is to get Q. What's Q here? Well, Q is going to equal negative W. But what's W defined as? Negative what? So negative PDV, negative PDV. Now, if this is done at constant external pressure, then this just turns into negative P delta V. OK. But on a reversible isothermal expansion, that's not done at constant pressure. So the fact that it's reversible means that the external pressure balances the internal pressure of the gas everywhere along the way. And so since that pressure, the external pressure is equal to the pressure of a gas, what's the pressure of a perfect gas? So nRT over V. And so this turns into Q equals negative, negative nRT over V dV. And I really should be including an integral the whole way through here. Cool. And that's going to be our Q. And this is ultimately what's going to get plugged into our expression of calculating delta S under a reversible isothermal either compression or expansion of a perfect gas. And so if we look at what happens here then, delta S turns into what's a negative times a negative? Positive. And so we get nRT over V dV also over T again. So in this case, what cancels and falls out of this expression? Cool. So in this case, n and r are constants. We'll pull them out front. What's the integral of 1 over v dv? Natural log. And if, assuming this is from initial to final volumes, this is where delta s equals n r ln of v final over v initial comes from. Cool. That's where that lovely expression comes from. By showing you where I derived it from, so we derived just the expression for w itself back last in the last material. So if you recall that derivation, it will make this one much simpler to remember as well. So it ends up being the same thing, except there's no t in there. And there's no negative sign, because it's actually coming from q, not from the w itself. Cool. One thing to note, this lovely expression, there's two things to note, actually. So one, I can do this in terms of the volumes, but I can also do this in terms of pressures. So what is V of a perfect gas equal to? Yeah, nRT over P. And so in this case, V final might be nRT over P final. And then V initial might be nRT over P initial. And if you substitute those in, then you might see that this is also equal to then n r l n of p initial over p final. Notice pressure and volume are inversely related, so it shouldn't surprise us too much that volume final over volume initial turns into pressure initial over pressure final. Other side of the coin. In the middle of the chapter in your textbook, they got this right. In the summary section at the back of the chapter, which I really like in your book, they got this wrong, that extra little t. They left that temperature in there in this expression. They forgot that it, you know, to cancel it out or whatever. They just copied it into the back section wrong. So keep in mind, the one that's in the middle of the chapter is right. The one that's at the summary section in the back of the chapter is wrong. So just don't get hosed on that. Cool. We've got a couple other situations to go that we've got to derive uh, dealing with this as well. So we might just have to look at 
so heating. So, and that heating could happen at constant pressure or constant volume. So in this case, let's say we're heating at constant pressure. So if we're heating at constant pressure, what's Q? Q is the same as delta H, which is what? We've been doing some calculations with it already. So yeah, yeah. So CP delta T, technically it's actually the integral of CP dt, the integral of CP dt. So however, if we got a constant heat capacity over a given range, that just turns into CP delta T. However, if you guys are given an equation for CP, sometimes I'll show you a temperature dependent equation for CP, then you gotta do this integral out. So however, if, if you're told to assume that this is constant, a constant number over that given range, it just pulls out in front of the integral, and what's the integral of just plain old dt from t initial to t final? Just delta t. So, and so in this case, that's what it usually comes down to. So in our case, um, if we actually are calculating delta s though instead, so delta s is equal to q reversible over t, which in our case is gonna be cp dt all over t. And so now, we can't just assume it's CP times delta T over T. T is part of that integral. What's the integral of one over T DT? So LN, and so in this case, we get CP LN. So, and in this case, assuming the integral is from T initial to T final, it's LN of T final over T initial. Cool, and that's where that lovely expression comes from. So I'll just summarize that up. Cool, that's assuming you're doing it at constant pressure. If you do this at constant volume, the expression comes out very similarly. I won't take the time to derive it, but we could, but it looks exactly the same. The extra term that should show up in here ends up being zero in this case and falls out and don't have to worry about it. And so whether you're doing this at constant pressure, or constant volume, it looks the same. Just using CP versus CV. Cool. So now we know how to deal with a reversible isothermal either expansion or compression. Notice that's at constant temperature. Or we know how to deal with situations where the temperature is changing. So at either constant volume or constant pressure. So what you're probably more likely gonna end up doing is dealing with a situation where multiple things are changing. And that's what we're gonna look at in the next example. You had one like that in your homework last week. So let's take a gander at this. Question on your sheet says, calculate the entropy change, 1.5 moles of a perfect gas expands from 12 liters to 24 liters and is simultaneously cooled from 298 Kelvin to 200 Kelvin. So, and you're given that CV, the molar value anyways, is 12.5 joules per k-mole. So if we kind of plot this out, what's going on here, it'll make a little more sense. So we're dealing with a volume change as well as with a temperature change. I'm gonna plot temperature on the y-axis, volume on the x. You could technically do this either way. So we're starting with an initial volume of 12 liters an initial temperature of 298 Kelvin. Maybe I should actually start this a little higher on my scale. So we're gonna cool this thing down and have the volume change simultaneously and end up at 24 liters and 200 Kelvin. And I wanna know what is delta S for this process. Cool, well delta S, just like delta H, is a state function. And being a state function, I'm not doing this. I don't know how to do this. So I'm gonna break it up into two steps. So 
I'm going to cool this thing down at constant volume. And then I'm going to let it expand, a reversible isothermal expansion at constant temperature. Because I know how to deal with a reversible isothermal expansion at constant temperature. I know how to deal with something cooling or, or being heated, so at constant volume. So if we look at the first step here, in dealing with something cooling at constant volume, how do I calculate delta S? Just like that. With constant volume, I deal with CV rather than CP. So for the first step there, diagrammed in red, delta S is going to equal CV ln T final over T initial. Based on what you guys know about entropy, if all I'm doing is a decrease in temperature, should entropy go up or down? Should go down, right? So delta S here should be negative. Well, if we look, we're going from a final temperature is 200, our initial temperature is 298. So we're going to have 200 over 298. That's going to be less than 1, and the natural log of a number less than 1 is negative. So this will come out negative, just like it's supposed to. Now, in the second part here, how are we going to deal with, so expanding the gas reversibly isothermally at a constant temperature? So that's the one we had up earlier there, where delta S equals nR ln V final over V initial. And notice, rather than giving you volumes, I could have given you pressures as well. We would use the alternate expression that had ln of P initial over P final instead. Same diff. Cool, and from here, we're just going to add these two steps together and go from there. One thing to note, the second step here, should delta S for an expansion of a gas at constant temperature be positive or negative? That should be positive. So this one's negative entropy change. This will be a positive entropy change. And we add the two together, whoever's bigger wins, right? So in this case, for the cooling, CV was given as, well, the molar CV was given, but how many moles do we actually have? How many? 0.5. So what's our CV for a 0.5 mole sample? Yeah, it'll be 0.5 moles times that. And so in this case, it's going to be 6.25 joules per Kelvin times the natural log of T final over T initial, so 200 over 298. And somebody get me what that comes out to. Negative 24.9. One more time now? Uh, negative 2.4. Cool. So now let's deal with our reversible isothermal expansion. So in this case, delta S, we got 0.5 moles. Ooh, what are we going to use for R? What's that? Exactly. Eight point three one four five joules per Kelvin mole, and I'll use that one. That way, this will come out in joules per Kelvin, just like our other one. So, what units do I want to use for volume? Doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? They're going to cancel anyways under the natural log. Awesome. So, in this case, we can leave it in liters, which is the same as decimeters cubed. Whatever, doesn't matter at all. What was our final volume? And our initial volume? Cool. Can somebody figure out what this is going to come out to? OK. And then the overall delta S then is just the sum of those two. So the first step was negative 2.49 joules per Kelvin, and our second fictitious step was a positive 2.88 joules per Kelvin. And so what was the overall delta S? Zero point what? Awesome. Joules per Kelvin. So again, notice we couldn't do this directly for the step as it was all in one step, but I can do break it down into a fictitious pathway. And because, again, it's a state function, I know how to do this. I know how to do this. Add the two together should be the same as the overall process because we're starting from the same initial state and ending up at the same final state.